It's really a pleasure to welcome uh, Emiliana Povic. Uh, let me read for you a summary of her CV and you will understand why I think she's one of these people that make the, the day to have 48 hours instead of 24. Uh, Miriana Povis is assistant professor at the Astronomy and Astrophysics Research and Development, uh, Development Division at the Ethiopian Space Science and Technology Institute. Also associate research at the Instituto de Astrophysica de Andalusia in Spain and honorary lecturer at uh, Parara University of Science and Technology in Uganda. She obtained her PhD in astrophysics in 2010 at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias in the field of active galaxies. Uh, her main research interests are related with galaxy formation and evolution, and in particular with nuclear activity in galaxies, star formation, morphological classification of galaxy and galaxy clusters. She has worked for more than 10 years in development in astronomy in different parts of Africa, uh, and that includes Ethiopia, but also Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, South Africa, Kenya, Ghana, and Zambia. She has done uh, the, uh, that through different projects and initiatives related with research co uh, collaborations, institutional development, students' supervisions, uh, training, lecturing, uh, regulation development, and outreach. She serves as a steering committee member of the IAU Division C on Education, Outreach, and Heritage and also science committee member of the African Astronomical Society, where she is chair of the committee of the African Network of Women in Astronomy. She has an active participation in the development of the very first uh, 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 Ethiopian space policy and on the Ethiopian uh, 30 years roadmap in, science, in space science and technology. In 2018, she received an inaugural Nature Research Award uh, for Inspiring Science. Uh, in May 2019, she was invited to, by Serbian government to be one of the 16 selected science ambassadors. ambassadors. In June 2019, she received a recognition from Ethiopian uh, Space Science and Technology Institute for Contribution to Development of Astronomy and Science in Ethiopia. And recently, in March, March of this year, uh, the recognition for the Ethiopian Space Science Society for her involvement in education and outreach. With all that in mind, I let her to explain the potential that Africa has to develop research in, ast in astronomy uh, and how it can benefit the African society. Um, the microphone, uh, Miriam. Yes, sorry for that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Omaira, and um, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think I will turn off my video uh, because of uh, delicate connection that I have. So can you just confirm if you can hear me and if you can see? Yes, the, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. So. Um, it is really my pleasure to be here with, uh, with all of you and uh, I would like to give my thanks to Mayra once again for inviting me to give uh, uh, this seminar and also to Sundar uh, for organizing uh, the seminar as well. Um, as you will see and as you can see from the title, this seminar will not be the pure research one. Uh, Omaira asked me to uh, share with you a bit uh, my experience in Ethiopia and uh, to speak about the work that we are doing there. So actually the talk will be divided into two parts. Uh, the first one will be more focused on astronomy for development, uh, using uh, uh, the work in, in Ethiopia as an example. And then in the second part of the talk, I will uh, share with you a bit the work that we are doing in extragalactic uh, group and uh, uh, research uh, that is focused on uh, AGN and physics uh, regarding nuclear activity in galaxies. And I will briefly go through different projects that uh, we are running. So. Um, uh, I like to put this uh, slide when I speak about uh, uh, astronomy for development uh, in general and then in Africa in particular, uh, because uh, it is really one of the most common questions that uh, I was getting over the uh, last 10-15 uh, years of my work in Africa, even from uh, uh, our very close uh, colleagues and astronomers. 
uh, asking why astronomy and space science uh, is uh, important uh, in Africa and why the government should invest in it, uh, taking into account uh, different crises uh, and the difficulties that many of the African countries are facing. And I think in order to really reply on this question, um, we need to do uh, a deeper uh, rethinking uh, on what the humanitarian aid uh, uh, was over the past uh, decades um, uh, and uh, how over the decades of the humanitarian aid we are still in a very uh, uncomfortable and unacceptable situation where we are facing huge differences between developed countries and the countries that are under development and then uh, taking Africa as an, uh, as an example with more than 50 countries where uh, really we are um, uh, facing uh, many, many challenges. So uh, in my perspective, I really see that um, uh, we have to shift more to the longer term um, uh, ways to fight uh, poverty. Uh, so yes, it is very important that we invest uh, in those uh, fields that are uh, the primary need uh, fields like in uh, uh, food, medical uh, care, um, uh, basic needs like electricity, water, and so on. But I think in the same time, in order really to fight poverty in the long term, we have to uh, invest in those uh, fields that I raised here, uh, in particular into education, science, technology, and then industrial development, but with uh, manufacturing being done in Africa. And I would also, beside this, like to add that uh, really, from my perspective, it's important that the initiatives are coming from our African colleagues and not really from the international programs that are uh, planned from uh, outside. Um, so in, in terms of uh, uh, the development, I think astronomy space science really shown uh, to be an important tool, uh, especially we've seen uh, that astronomy uh, uh, is really an efficient tool to promote education, to also inspire the young ones uh, uh, for doing science. Uh, we have now uh, great examples that uh, both astronomy and space science can really contribute also to the economical growth. And here I would raise the, the example of uh, South Africa, which is not the only one. But since we are talking about Africa, South Africa is really a great example where the government recognized astronomy and space science as uh, priority fields in order to uh, contribute to their economical uh, growth. Um, we know that also through astronomy, uh, we are uh, constantly coming to the edge of our knowledge, which again brings us uh, toward the constant technological uh, developments and innovation. Um, also, uh, we know that um, uh, many of the uh, long-term projects uh, are also big international collaborations. And then in that aspect, uh, we've been uh, seeing that uh, astronomy can be also used as an important tool for promoting peace and diplomacy. And also, we should not forget that uh, basically our daily life nowadays depends on uh, satellite uh, and uh, space-based uh, data and that space-based data can be used in all different aspects of uh, our uh, society for improving the access to the water, uh, uh, agriculture productivity, access to the natural resources, and so on and so on. So then if all of this is uh, really true, then uh, uh, why, and if we've seen that astronomy space science have been used uh, across the world for development, then why uh, African governments uh, should not use it uh, as, as, uh, as well. So, um, uh, in particular, if we consider that uh, in Africa we still have um, uh, dark skies as one of the natural resources, and um, when I say that, uh, I'm not saying that uh, we should stay uh, as such in terms of the access to the electricity, but uh, definitely, if, uh, if it's one of the natural resources, uh, um, uh, there are possibilities that we can conserve these uh, uh, areas, and there are plans uh, to do that uh, as well uh, in the future. So um, uh, this is also one of the, um, I would say, uh, continental um, initiatives uh, to use astronomy and space science for development. And in 2015, when uh, uh, UN came with the Sustainable Development Goals after the Millennium Goals, uh, African Union also came with the uh, development agenda uh, and uh, uh, it assigned uh, as a second pillar science, technology and innovation in order to reach sustainable development goals. 
uh, raising the importance of uh, space and then also uh, geospatial technologies. And that led to the uh, establishment of African Space Agency uh, two years ago in Egypt and also to development of the very first African Space Strategy, where again, on the continental level, the space science and astronomy were recognized as uh, important tools. Um, in, uh, in terms of the continental initiatives, uh, we also now have African Astronomical Society uh, um, uh, re-established. It was re-established last year in, uh, in South Africa. And under uh, AFAS, uh, we are now trying to really um, uh, put all the efforts together and then uh, work uh, uh, jointly on the development of astronomy across the continent in terms of research, in terms of institutional development, in terms of outreach, education, and so on. So there are many, many uh, uh, actually activities uh, uh, running and, uh, and coming uh, uh, in the near future. Um, here you can see just a brief uh, summary. Uh, in 2018, we published uh, uh, one of the papers on the status uh, in astronomy and space science in Africa. Uh, taking into account the, feed, the feedback from uh, uh, our colleagues from more than 20 African countries. And it was really an amazing uh, work because uh, I've seen uh, that uh, uh, there has been so much uh, that is actually going on. Uh, we are planning under African Astronomical Society to come up uh, soon with the update uh, of this uh, map uh, because many things have been done also in the last uh, two years. Similar is in terms of the space science, so many uh, governments in different African countries are now establishing their space agencies, research centers, different departments putting space science and astronomy at their departments at universities. So uh, really, uh, I could say that uh, the time is coming for, um, for astronomy uh, being part of the continental uh, development. And uh, um, uh, beside the continental uh, initiatives, uh, I will also focus now more on Ethiopia, using it as an example. Uh, four years ago, when I uh, received the invitation from Ethiopia to, uh, to go there and uh, to join uh, the Ethiopian Space Science and Technology Institute that what was recently established at that time, uh, and uh, which I really happily accepted, um, the motto of, uh, uh, of the Institute uh, and the ministry is that we explore the universe for the benefit of our people. And this is really the vision that the Institute uh, has and also the Space Science and Technology Council, uh, where people really believe that uh, using uh, space science and technology, we can uh, improve some of the main challenges uh, uh, that uh, uh, Ethiopia is uh, uh, facing and contribute to the uh, social and economical uh, growth. Um, so astronomy astrophysics is one of the departments that uh, we have under the ESSTI. And I will now go just briefly through different activities that we are uh, running. And each activity, I will try to also connect uh, uh, how on a long term we can contribute to some of the uh, sustainable development goals. So uh, one of the main activities that we have is uh, the postgraduate program that now for the very first time since uh, five years ago, six years ago actually is running in Ethiopia. So we are basically having the very first MSc PhD students in astronomy. And uh, all of our students are already um, uh, connected to some of the public university, which means that in this way, we are really improving the level of education in the country. And again, on the longer term, uh, contribute uh, to the fourth uh, sustainable development goal uh, related with uh, quality education. Human capacity building and the training of um, uh, our students and then the young staff members that are the majority of uh, actually staff members under the Institute is another task. Uh, and then again, on the longer term, uh, we are contributing to the eight, um, uh, eight uh, uh, sustainable development goal. Uh, research is another part, uh, uh, important part of the department. We currently have uh, three research uh, groups. Uh, a lot of work has been done over the last uh, four years on the institutional development because when we started, we really started from zero. We didn't even have um, uh, any uh, clear uh, defined uh, departments. Um, uh, structure, committees, and so on. And also over these last uh, four years, uh, writing proposals, uh, asking for the grants, and then organization of trainings, workshops, meetings, conferences, and so on was uh, one of the big uh, tasks. So with all of this, 
uh, we see that we can contribute in different ways, producing the very first publications, uh, uh, contributing to the science development, giving the visibility to the science and astronomy in Ethiopia, contribute to the human capacity building, strength, uh, uh, we can strengthen our international collaborations and so on. And in this way, we can at least uh, contribute uh, to these uh, six uh, uh, sustainable development goals that I uh, mentioned uh, here. This is just an example of some of the meetings that we organized over the past years. And I would mention here the IU Symposium that was organized last year, uh, where Omaira also uh, came. Uh, and uh, uh, during this symposium, we really managed to benefit even the broader society, organizing different trainings for teachers, uh, school children, uh, students, young researchers, and so on. Uh, Technological development is another uh, part. Uh, currently, Ethiopia has a very small uh, observatory uh, with two telescopes of one meter that we are still trying to put it uh, in a fully operational mode. There have been really many challenges, uh, but hopefully uh, we will start with uh, uh, operation soon. And in the same time, uh, there, are, uh, there is a site testing going on uh, at north of Lalibela uh, uh, at um, um, around 4,000 uh, meters here on the left, I put uh, the, the picture, where you, the map, where you can see that Ethiopia is really a mountain country and we are having uh, 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 many uh, uh, peaks above 3,000 meters with dry uh, climate. So uh, Ethiopia does have a um, uh, dream that uh, it could be maybe one of uh, also astronomical, potential astronomical sites uh, in future and in that way contribute to its uh, also uh, social and economical growth. Uh, policy framework was another uh, part where we had to work on the very first Ethiopian space policy and strategy. And then currently we are working on the 30 years uh, plan for development of space science and technology. And this is important for uh, bringing the political engagement on the long term. Uh, and I think that uh, that uh, again is fundamental for basically all sustainable development goals. Uh, we organized uh, several teachers' trainings, not only in Ethiopia, but in, uh, in East African region as well, nine trainings in, uh, in total. And here I would really like to raise uh, an amazing work that network at NASA, Network of uh, Astronomy School Education and the Galileo Teachers' Trainings Program are doing. Uh, and again, uh, through this, um, the trainings were organized in practical astronomy, where we are actually showing, uh, beside astronomy, uh, a different... Um, uh, methodology that can be applied uh, in uh, education. Uh, and then a lot of work was really done over the past years, constantly, I would say, on education, outreach, and the public awareness as well. Uh, here I listed only some of the activities. I will not have time to go into uh, details, but again, on the long term, it is really fundamental for several sustainable development goals. And uh, finally, I would also like to uh, raise the work that we are involved uh, um, uh, with uh, the girls and women in science. Um, uh, last year, in collaboration with uh, 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 Society of Ethiopian Women in Science and Technology, we started STEM for Girls in Ethiopia initiative, working with uh, secondary school girls and also teachers. And um, uh, now we are in the process of establishing Africa Network of Women in Astronomy that uh, has been uh, accepted as a new committee under the African Astronomical Society. And we are now working on the three years uh, plan of activities that actually we have to submit uh, uh, next week. So I hope that about uh, uh, this initiative, you will hear soon more. Uh, um, yeah, you will hear uh, more um, in, in near future. And finally, I also would like to raise that uh, what I really observed in the last uh, four years uh, in, in Ethiopia is that um, beside constant crises that we are facing uh, in different uh, aspects uh, uh, of uh, social life, economical life, political life, and so on, uh, having uh, programs uh, like um, uh, uh, those that ESSTI is running and uh, launching the very first satellite that we managed to do last year or having the Entoto Observatory. Uh, it's really something that is giving uh, the hope uh, and a lot of optimism uh, uh, to, to our Ethiopian uh, colleagues uh, and, and society in general. And something that people are proud of that, as I said, when you are living in the conditions that are in general challenging, uh, this kind of, um, having this kind of initiatives is also very much um, uh, inspiring for the young population. Uh, 
Um, so the second part uh, of the, that's a bit the summary uh, uh, of the work that, of most of the work, I mean, the, the main work that has been uh, running, actually, if we go into the details, there is much, much more. And uh, now the second part of, uh, of the talk, I will focus more uh, on uh, the research that we are doing under the ESSTI, uh, and in particular under the extragalactic um, uh, research group uh, where most of the projects basically all are focused uh, on the nuclear activity in galaxies and physics uh, behind the uh, AGN. Uh, here uh, this picture that you can see uh, doesn't have to do of course with AGN but it does have to do somehow with astronomy. It's really one of the unique places on the earth. It's uh, in Afar region on the uh, northeastern uh, part of Ethiopia. Very very dry uh, area and it's uh, Danakil uh, depression. And this place uh, is one of the um, uh, driest, uh, the hottest, and also the most acid places uh, on the earth. And uh, uh, now it's been um, uh, um, uh, known every time more and more uh, for its research in astrobiology. So there are several projects, international projects, some of them financed by the European Commission as well, that are actually doing their uh, uh, a field uh, um, uh, work uh, here in Danakil, um, taking into account that uh, many of the properties that you can find uh, in uh, Danakil in terms of uh, geology composition uh, is very much similar to those that we can see, for example, on, uh, on Mars. So maybe in the future um, you will be able to hear more about Danakil or even uh, visit us. So uh, how we can uh, uh, contribute to development uh, focusing on AGN research? Uh, here I uh, try to raise the, some of the, um, uh, the fields. Uh, so definitely like anywhere else, we can contribute to the knowledge generation uh, and then to the science development, astronomy development in general. As I said, uh, astronomy is really very, very young uh, field of science uh, in Ethiopia. And basically, we started with uh, all development uh, only four or five years uh, ago. Uh, we definitely can uh, contribute to human capacity building. Uh, you will see that many of the projects that uh, uh, we are running under the department are related with MSc and PhD uh, students. And all of our students, as I mentioned previously, uh, are already working at some of the um, uh, Ethiopian public universities uh, as uh, lecturers. So once they get uh, their uh, MSc or PhD degree, uh, then they will be working with hundreds of students after. So uh, definitely through the human capacity building of uh, these people, we can then improve the level of education across uh, Ethiopia. Uh, so um, that means that educational development is also in, uh, included. Uh, we managed through the AGN um, uh, research to really strengthen the international collaborations that the ESSTI has with now uh, different institutes across the world. Um, also, we use uh, the work that we are doing through different, uh, through different outreach and public uh, uh, awareness activities. Uh, we managed in the last four years to give really a lot of visibility to the ESSTI, including the AGN conference that I mentioned, the symposium that I mentioned uh, uh, previously that we organized last year. I didn't mention that that was the only third symposium organized in Africa in the last uh, 100 years and definitely the first one for Ethiopia. And also through the AGN research, we managed to contribute to the institutional um, uh, development. So now I will go briefly uh, through the summary of, uh, uh, of the project, some of the projects that we are uh, running. So the uh, first one I will mention is uh, the study of the properties of AGN and non-AGN Green Valley galaxies. And um, uh, this project was motivated with previous studies, both in X-rays and then in optical, where uh, um, it has been suggested that uh, uh, at least in X-rays, the X-ray detected AGN have been seen to um, 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 reside in, in the Green Valley. Uh, and then that was uh, uh, used uh, as a suggestion that AGN might uh, uh, be uh, responsible for quenching the star formation in galaxies. Then um, 
uh, years later in optical, it has been seen uh, as well using SDSS data uh, that um, most of the AGN are actually below the main sequence of the star formation. And again, it was uh, suggested the same that AGN might uh, quench the star uh, formation in galaxies. So uh, in this work, we focused, what we wanted to uh, do is uh, to go to the Green Valley Galaxy, select AGN, non-AGN um, uh, sources uh, using uh, Cosmos data and then uh, try to really understand what is the role of AGN in the morphological uh, transformation. Uh, we use the public Cosmos data, but we also used, uh, applied, we applied for the SALT uh, uh, time and we got uh, uh, time for uh, observing a small subsample, uh, in particular focusing on the oxygen free line. And we also used uh, uh, Herschel five, uh, far infrared uh, data. So some of the results that we obtained was uh, that um, when we compared AGN and AGN galaxies, as you can see here on the, uh, on the left uh, plot, um, and we um, uh, looked for their location uh, in terms of the main sequence of star formation that is uh, marked uh, here with the uh, straight lines, uh, we actually found that uh, AGN uh, uh, have, uh, that, that AGN are also uh, located uh, uh, on the main sequence of the star formation. So at least those that uh, have the far infrared uh, uh, emission. So star formation rates uh, here have been measured uh, using the far infrared data. And then when we compared for also the same mass range, because we know that AGN um, uh, reside in more massive galaxies, we also found that actually AGN, at least those, as I said, that are far infrared um, uh, emitters uh, have actually higher star formation rates. Uh, saying that uh, we don't really see that they are then responsible for the quenching of the star formation. And if there is any influence of the AGN on the star formation, then actually uh, it would be rather enhancing star formation than quenching it. So uh, this result could also be related with uh, other um, um, uh, with other uh, factors, not only with the AGN feedback, uh, such as morphology. So in the second paper that uh, we published uh, last year, we then uh, did uh, the detailed analysis of the morphological properties. So indeed, we found that in about 30% of those AGN that are on the main uh, sequence or above uh, are actually peculiar with clear signs of uh, mergers or interruptions, which could uh, lead to their higher star formation rates. But beside that, uh, we also found higher star formation rates for other uh, morphological types, such as uh, the early and delay type uh, galaxies, where still um, uh, the AGN, the positive AGN uh, feedback uh, might be uh, uh, one of the roles. Uh, currently, we are uh, also doing the analysis uh, of the stellar populations uh, using the public spectra of a smaller uh, subsample. And also we are analyzing uh, the salt data, uh, the oxygen uh, free data, where in um, uh, actually all of the sources that we have up to now, we observe the small blue uh, shift. Uh, so we are uh, still in a process of really analyzing uh, the spectra and understanding what is uh, going on. The next project that we are also running, uh, uh, yes, I didn't actually set here, I put a picture, but uh, uh, this project is uh, actually part, it was first part, the first paper was part of the master uh, study of uh, Antoine uh, Maoro, uh, who, did it in who did his master in Rwanda, Uganda, and now um, uh, he's doing his PhD in uh, South Africa, so actually it's a collaboration between South Africa, Ethiopia, and uh, Rwanda. Uh, the next project is focused on the properties of galaxies in galaxy clusters uh, within the GLACE collaboration that is focused on uh, the evolution of galaxy in galaxy clusters. And it's uh, the collaboration between Ethiopia, Spain, and forms the part of uh, PhD thesis of uh, Teleke, uh, Teleke Belloro. So in this work, our main aim is uh, to understand better the role of AGN in galaxy cluster, metallicities, morphology, and then star formation focusing on free galaxy clusters. Uh, the one that is at uh, redshift 0.4, that is the one that we analyzed, that is the principal uh, galaxy cluster for this PhD thesis. And then another cluster that we analyzed in other uh, papers of GLACE, that is at 0.9, uh, 
And finally, Virgo cluster comparing it with the local Virgo cluster uh, using the public data. So in um, uh, uh, up to now, uh, we the first part of the work was uh, to really uh, come up with the detailed morphological classification of the galaxies at 0 0.4, and we managed to bring the most detailed catalog up to um, a cluster centric distance of uh, one megaparsec that was published in the first paper of uh, Tseleki last year. Uh, there we observed uh, that in this cluster, uh, the majority of galaxies are actually early type, and we observed some of the uh, correlations that have been raised in other, in previous works uh, with similar clusters that are um, uh, evolved uh, uh, and uh, well-formed clusters. In the second paper, we focused actually on the tunable filters data from the GTC, uh, studying the H uh, beta and oxygen free lines, so it's like we had to go through all the data reduction, and then using the pseudo spectra, we analyzed uh, all different properties, uh, uh, including the selection of emission line galaxies. So in the second paper that has been uh, recently submitted to the monthly notices, and now we are waiting for the report, uh, we actually provide uh, different uh, analysis of the, uh, of the emission line cattle, uh, of the emission line galaxies um, classified in, um, detected in, in this uh, cluster. Uh, and what is uh, uh, now coming is uh, the comparison of uh, the results obtained uh, for 0 0.4 cluster uh, with uh, the other two uh, clusters that uh, we are hoping to finalize in the coming few months. Uh, the next project uh, is between Ethiopia and Spain um, with my colleagues from the IAA. And uh, uh, it forms a part of uh, Tilakun Getachew's uh, uh, thesis, PhD thesis. And in this uh, uh, project, we are focused on morphological properties of active galaxies, but um, uh, using uh, our idea is uh, to use different uh, deep surveys. But the first thing that we want to do is uh, in details to really understand how the AGN contribution can affect morphological classification and then uh, do the test uh, on the cosmos uh, field when we have a higher uh, redshift and uh, finally do uh, reclassification of galaxies in the cosmos field. Um, the final aim is actually uh, that is a bit out of the scope of uh, uh, Tilakun's thesis because it's a lot of work. Uh, the final aim is once we have uh, the new classification is to actually study the luminosity function in terms of the morphology. So these are some of the results. Uh, this is in the top left uh, plot is a bit uh, how we did, uh, where you can see uh, uh, how we um, uh, did uh, the uh, models. Uh, so we took a sample of about 2000 uh, local galaxies from SDSS, and then we simulated these galaxies by adding in the central part different AGN contributions. So from 5% uh, to 75%. For each of 2,000 galaxies, we used their own particular PSF uh, uh, image. And uh, we then measured six morphological parameters uh, that are the most used parameters uh, that we have in the literature. And we measured these parameters for the original SDSS sample and then for the galaxies uh, where different AGN contribution was added. And we did that at uh, redshift zero. And then when we move galaxy and we simulate them, uh, uh, mapping the uh, magnitude and redshift distribution that corresponds to the cosmos field. So uh, it's actually really quite a technical work uh, with a lot of details. So the first paper is uh, currently in preparation and we've seen that uh, uh, actually up to uh, that above the AGN contribution of 25%, all of the morphological parameters will be significantly affected. And actually we can have a, um, uh, wrong classification, morphological classification of galaxies. And uh, the second paper uh, uh, is, uh, uh, so the first paper will be for the local uh, sample at redshift zero, and then the second paper is when we uh, move the galaxies to the higher uh, redshift. Um, the uh, next project uh, was a part of the MSc work of uh, De Gene, who is currently doing his PhD in, uh, in Chile. And in, uh, in this work, we actually used the previous result from uh, Khalifa uh, with uh, integral field uh, uh, spectroscopy, where uh, our colleagues uh, saw that there is a significant range, there is a certain range of the stellar mass that you can uh, approximately see here. 
for which the galaxies uh, uh, seem to have highest growth rate. Or let's say that uh, the shorter, that the assembly times of these galaxies are shorter within the inner regions. So these galaxies we call inside out assembled uh, galaxies or galaxy candidates actually. And uh, in this work of, uh, uh, with the Gene, what we wanted to do is uh, to understand better what are the properties of these galaxies in terms of the star formation rate, stellar mass, uh, I mean, uh, star formation rates, uh, location uh, of these galaxies on the, in respect to the main sequence of star formation in terms of the morphology, uh, spectroscopic type, infrared properties, and so on. So the paper was uh, uh, published uh, recently in monthly notices, and uh, here you can see just one of the plots uh, where we uh, compared uh, these where these galaxies are in uh, respect to the uh, infrared transition zone for different uh, spectroscopic side, uh, types on the top and then morphological types. And what we've observed, some of the main findings uh, are that uh, uh, the high fraction of uh, these candidates, the uh, inside out assembled galaxy candidates are actually in the process of quenching. Um, the, those galaxies that we classified as AGN actually uh, have a, a lower star formation rates and therefore they could be uh, related with uh, uh, star formation quenching. But taking into account that uh, uh, most of the uh, sources actually have the spiral morphology independently on their uh, spectroscopic type, uh, it could suggest that uh, the central star formation uh, might be suppressed before we actually have the morphological transformation uh, going on. Uh, in the next project, uh, uh, it's really a nice collaboration between uh, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Uganda, and South Africa. And this project formed uh, uh, part of the MSc of uh, Beatrice. Uh, and Beatrice is now just starting with, with her uh, PhD. So in this work, uh, what we actually wanted to be again focused on Green Valley galaxies, but we wanted to really study in more detail selection criteria because in the previous literature, uh, so these galaxies, as you've seen from the Antoine work, are really important for understanding how the galaxies are moving from the blue cloud to the red sequence. And then uh, if we really want to understand what is the role of AGN in that transition, again, uh, uh, Green Valley is uh, fundamental. However, there have been in the literature uh, different uh, criteria used from uh, using the UV data, optical data. And then uh, uh, in this work, what we wanted to uh, do is actually understand what kind of galaxies we are actually selecting when we are using one criteria, criteria or another and how that can then affect uh, different results that people are getting. Because when you go to the literature um, uh, review of the Green Valley galaxies, it's really a mess. So uh, we used six criteria, so two criteria, two color criteria with UV and optical colors, and then using again UV sample, optical sample, we used the star form specific star formation criteria, and then another two star formation rate versus uh, stellar mass criteria, and we put the, uh, we used the uh, Sloan data, and we used the criteria that have been uh, selected in different previous works. So what we have observed is actually some of the main findings um, are that uh, uh, as expected, the Green Valley galaxies that have been selected using different uh, criteria actually present different population of galaxies in terms of their stellar mass, star formation rate, and also different types uh, in terms of the spectroscopy, spectroscopic types and then morphological types as well. The uh, highest difference we obtained when we compared the um, uh, the two criteria based on either optical or UV colors, finding that for the UV colors, we are actually selecting in the Green Valley more massive galaxies with uh, lower uh, star formation rates. So we definitely have to be very careful uh, when we are um, uh, selecting the, the proper criteria and using this uh, uh, later on in our, our discussion. Um, the next project is uh, um, uh, related with uh, studying the dichotomy between the radio loud and radio quiet quasars and the effect that the radio jet uh, has on the, on the gas uh, and in the, in the broad line uh, region. And it forms the part of uh, Schimele's uh, Terefes thesis. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, it's the work done in collaboration with Spain and, uh, and Italy with our colleagues, uh, with Choni from IA and then with Paola Marziani from, uh, from 
uh, of the father uh, observatory. So in this work, we actually use uh, a sample of about 60 radio loud, radio quiet uh, quasars uh, using our own uh, Color Alto uh, data and then public uh, first uh, radio data. And as I said, uh, the, um, uh, the work is uh, uh, in optical. We are actually focused on fitting the emission lines. Uh, so currently we are running the fittings of uh, H-beta and magnesium lines. So here you can see the example uh, of one of the, the sources. This is the original uh, spectra on the left top and then um, uh, the, uh, the fittings of the H-beta uh, line together with the uh, two oxygen lines, uh, the helium-2 line and so on, the iron line and so on. And then also how this uh, source looks like in uh, radio. So we are using spec fit for uh, all the line fittings and then we already inspect the radio uh, data using both uh, NVSS and then first uh, data. And we observed that uh, the sample that we have uh, of the radio loud uh, quasars are actually having very particular and very diverse radio morphologies. So we expect that this work can really bring uh, very interesting and very important uh, results. Um, the next project uh, is uh, related with the study of uh, ultra hard X ray AGN in the bus uh, survey. So in the, in the BAT uh, SWIFT uh, survey, we are using uh, public data. And this project is somehow divided into two. The first part uh, is, uh, was a part of MSC project of uh, Betty. Uh, we are now trying to, to work on the very small uh, uh, publication. And in this work, uh, for the very first time, uh, what we wanted to test is the multi-wavelength morphological study of this ultra-hard uh, X-ray detected uh, AGN. So we use the public data, uh, SDSS data in optical, then first NVSS in radio, and then XMMM and Chandra in, um, uh, in X-rays. And we did the visual classification. So Betty went uh, in details uh, uh, and classified about 700 galaxies in optical, separating into elliptical, spiral, irregular, peculiar. Uh, in optical, actually, we did it in parallel for, uh, for having uh, at least uh, two classifiers. Then in radio, on uh, loud and uh, radio loud, radio quiet. And in X-rays, we divided all galaxies into compact and uh, uh, extended. And we found that uh, for the ultra-hard X-ray detected AGN, uh, they can be hosted by all morphological types, but that the larger fraction, so more than 40%, uh, percent, uh, are actually hosted by uh, spiral galaxies in optical, which is not really uh, what we found previously for X-ray detected AGN galaxies in general, where the early type morphologies uh, are dominating. And we also found that uh, beside being in spiral, they are mainly uh, radio quiet and then uh, compact in, uh, in X-rays. And the second part is something that I'm trying to do in, in the free time that I find that I don't have actually much. Uh, and it's uh, focused on the same survey, the bus survey, uh, trying to study the stellar population. So we want to understand how the stellar populations are of this ultra hard X-ray detected AGM. So, I'm going now through the, uh, through the um, uh, spectral fittings uh, using uh, starlight and uh, the preliminary result that we got uh, for uh, about half of the sample is that actually the stellar populations are predominantly intermediate and uh, old, uh, which is pretty much in line with the, uh, with the um, uh, other X-ray uh, studies of uh, AGN, although not uh, uh, in ultra hard. Um, and I will just briefly mention the last two projects. Uh, they are, um, uh, they form part of the MSC uh, uh, thesis. One is uh, uh, Astrate's uh, work uh, where uh, using the results uh, uh, from 2009, where we've seen that uh, um, maybe the X-ray to optical flux ratio could be approximated to the, could be one of the indicators, photometric indicators of the accretion rate. So uh, using that result and suggestion, as I said, from 2009 and 2012 in my previous works with Astrata, we tried to really test that using the spectroscopic SDSS uh, data. Uh, so we are now uh, actually going uh, through it. And then the second uh, work is uh, also MSC work of uh, Daudi Mazengo from Tanzania, who is uh, actually the very first astronomy student in Tanzania, 
where uh, we again focused on SDSS uh, data and we tried to understand uh, better how the um, one of the um, classification diagrams that has been uh, suggested for uh, distinguishing between liners and uh, retired galaxies, uh, how well actually it uh, works. And we went through different uh, properties of liners and then retired uh, galaxies. And actually we've seen that uh, uh, this uh, diagram uh, uh, is not fully efficient for separating the two populations. So possibly in the future, having more precise uh, spectroscopic data and larger uh, samples of galaxies, uh, one of the points uh, would be to really search for uh, additional methods uh, in order to better classify the AGN um, uh, um, photo, uh, photo ionized uh, uh, liners and those that are photo ionized maybe with post AGN stars. And um, this is a bit the summary of the AGN work that we are doing. Uh, I will here mention just some of the in, uh, continental initiatives that are also running. So a lot of it is really going on, uh, including uh, the development uh, in Africa with radio astronomy that is running for the last few years, the African Initiative for, for Planetary Space Science, ISP is really supporting a lot the human capacity building. And then um, uh, in, uh, within uh, Spanish Astronomical Soci Society, we are now trying to bring a new committee that is CEA uh, para el Desarrollo, so CEA for the development, and then uh, uh, contribute more to different collaborations, such as the collaborations between Spain and East uh, Africa. So uh, this is just a reminder uh, that in 2024, there will be the very first General Assembly uh, organized in Africa. So we are actually preparing a lot of uh, uh, things for that General Assembly. And we are really seeing it as an opportunity, not only for the science, but for really uh, benefiting our society uh, using astronomy. And uh, uh, I would like to stop here. I hope I didn't... Uh, I didn't uh, hear that I'm left with 10, 15 minutes. I hope I didn't, uh, I'm still on time to finish. And uh, uh, so thank you very much for your um, uh, attention. Um, and um, uh, this is just a picture from one of the events uh, from June, uh, from the solar eclipse, uh, where uh, our people in Ethiopia really managed to, to to get to use astronomy to really bring the, the science and education to the most remote areas in, uh, in Ethiopia. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Mariana. That was an excellent summary. Um, we have time for a few questions. So let's see some raised hands or just, yeah, okay. Rosa, go ahead. Hi, thank you for the talk. It's really very inspiring to see the development of astronomy in, in Africa. It's wonderful. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes, Rosa, I can hear you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you. So my, my question was about the first project that you presented. Um, the one about, it was about the Green Valley. Mm -hmm. And and I, I think that one of the caveats of using um, the infrared or f to, um, to measure star formation is actually the contamination from the AGN. Exactly. So, yes. so we did, what, we did uh, correct. So we, we used, uh, yes, so we used uh, the templates. So we, we uh, measured the star formation rates using the uh, far infrared uh, data separately for non-AGN and then for the AGN uh, galaxies. So we used for uh, different templates for uh, non-AGN and then for AGN. So in case of AGN, we included the AGN templates and then we measured what is the AGN contribution and then removed the AGN contribution for remeasuring the star formation rates. So I didn't mention that uh, because of the time, but in the plot that I've, I've seen, that I've uh, shown, uh, it's already with corrected star formation rates uh, for, for AGN. Okay, well, thank you. So, so they, they do look that they like they fall on the on the main sequence, except for a very few where they seem to have an excess. From exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But this is the very first time that we are observing uh, this uh, uh, because in all previous studies 
uh, using optical data, we, uh, we observed that AGN are actually below the main sequence of star formation. So this is the, the first time that we are seeing using, when we include now far infrared data, that actually we are getting uh, that they are on the main sequence or uh, at the above uh, or uh, above the main sequence. Mm -hmm. And we think the higher star formation rates in terms of the non-AGN. So definitely here, we are not saying all AGN are enhancing star formation. We are saying that those that are X-ray detected with far infrared emission uh, um, uh, is what we are, I mean, uh, are having higher star formation rates in the Green Valley in comparison with non-AGN. Okay. Thank you. Very nice. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Rosa. We have uh, Rene. Uh, hi. Hello. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I, I actually have two questions. Uh, one is that um, it, uh, you, are, you are mentioning this like pan-African efforts in development, uh, using astronomy for development, uh, but uh, Africa is a very big and diverse country. How, how do you think this, uh, um, this is working? And because it's, uh, uh, well, it's, very, it's a very big uh, um, uh, country, uh, continent, I mean. Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and do you think this, there would be like a, a, a evo natural evolution towards more national organizations in astronomy like we see in other parts of the world? That is like one question. And the other one is, uh, how, are you, how are you convincing governments uh, and authorities that it is important to invest in space science and astronomy uh, when, when the appeal of saying uh, we have more urgent things to do is like, uh, well, that's that's kind of the answer that you you get from these things. Yes, uh, thank you, Rene, uh, for your questions and also attention. So, for the first question regarding the Pan African initiatives, uh, uh, initiatives. So, we are now really managing uh, to bring the initiatives, uh, especially some of them that I mentioned, to really be on the continental level. You know, I think in that aspect, even before the establishment of the African Astronomical Society. We were already on the on the good path, I would say. Definitely, to that uh, contributed a lot to the establishment of uh, the Office of Astronomy for Development of the IAU, mm -hmm. and the fact that it is based in South Africa, and then creation uh, in the past years of different nodes. So the Western uh, West Africa, East Africa, uh, South Africa regional nodes of uh, uh, Office of Astronomy for Development. So. Through that, uh, we already were with different projects in the path of really um, bringing every time more astronomy to be the continental initiative, you know? Uh, although on the national levels, uh, there are uh, things going on, you know? With the re-establishment of uh, African Astronomical Society, I say re-establishment because it was established after to the year of astronomy in 2009, but it was really mm -hmm. not uh, active, you know? So last year, with the re-establishment of Ast uh, African Astronomical Society that now is supported, funded actually, by the Department of Science and uh, Innovation, South African government uh, is, uh, is uh, supporting it. So uh, with this now, uh, we are really uh, trying to bring uh, the astronomy to be the continental initiative. So this doesn't mean that we are uh, man that we managed up to now to really include all countries. Even last year when we had a meeting and then um, the, in March, then in uh, the, uh, October, we also organized another meeting in Ethiopia. And this year in March, we were supposed to have the third meeting, you know, but uh, it didn't happen because of COVID. So there are still about um, uh, basically half of the countries uh, African countries or a bit more than half of the African countries that are not there, that still don't have any astronomy going on or space mm -hmm. science. And actually, if you look on the map, basically all uh, North African countries do have established uh, astronomy and except um, maybe Libya, Tunisia is uh, there, but more with uh, amateur astronomy. But the other countries have already strong um, uh, establishment of the even on the institutional level space agencies and so on then west africa uh, is really uh, there uh, with more and more initiatives uh, every time like ghana burkina faso senegal uh, nigeria that is extremely active east africa is really i would say uh, that's what actually my field is and where i worked uh, the most over the past uh, 10 years and basically all east african countries except burundi 
uh, do have now astronomy and space science, either at their universities, uh, either at uh, as the uh, independent uh, uh, research centers, like uh, in case of Ethiopia that I mentioned, Sudan, North Sudan as well, uh, uh, also uh, Kenya and so on. And then uh, southern part of, uh, of Africa, including South Africa, of course, but also Namibia. I mean, that one, that part is actually now even more involved because of the SKA. So mm -hmm. we are really managing to bring this to be the Pan-African initiatives. And I'm really um, um, optimistic uh, that uh, uh, in the next, let's say, five, ten years, um, uh, I think uh, many achievements will be, will be possible. National in initiatives that you mentioned, yes. So in the same line, uh, we now have more national in initiatives, either in terms of the amateur astronomy societies or, or professional, uh, already professional uh, societies as well. And then how to convince the governments, uh, this is uh, uh, actually the most uh, difficult uh, task, of course. I mean, even in develop, developed countries, uh, we have to constantly convince the governments why uh, investing in science is important. So not even necessarily astronomy, but, you know, science in general, and that really without science, we, we can't speak about future. So uh, this is something that I think that uh, we can never be fully satisfied. It's it's a constant uh, um, uh, fight for the for the rights. A constant, uh, you know, um, uh, we, we just cannot uh, um, uh, take it uh, uh, easy. No. So in Africa, of course, uh, because of uh, uh, all challenges and difficulties that are there, and definitely serious uh, issue of the the funding. Uh, investing in astronomy space science is not an easy thing, but there are examples, no? Uh, I mean, uh, the example of Ethiopia that I mentioned, I mean, uh, all the program is really Ethiopian initiative. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm actually the only foreigner uh, working at the ESSTI. So all my colleagues are Ethiopian colleagues. So uh, it's, it is fully national uh, initiative and uh, it really serves as an example. So having examples as such, such as uh, South Africa, now Ethiopia, Egypt, Nigeria, uh, Morocco, uh, Sudan that is there coming, or Ghana that also has a space science technology center and so on. And for the other countries, it's really a, a, a stimulation uh, to really uh, start thinking in, in that longer term uh, project, uh, I mean, longer term development as well. As I said, in Ethiopia, we are working now on the first year's uh, program uh, for the development, you know, including space science and technology. You know? So it's, it's really uh, important in, in, in terms of the political engagement. You know? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Renee. Uh, Omaira? Great talk, Miliana. Just yes, you are really a brave person. I want you to, to know. Uh, I want you to, to talk to us a little bit on, because you said uh, you started this uh, like five years ago or five to four to five years ago. Uh, but I want you to explain to us uh, from where you began. No, how many researchers uh, were when you arrived there, how many are now, how many students do you have in your own, from how many countries, and also how many males and females are in the department. So to, to get the, the feeling on how uh, uh, difficult it was when you, you started and how difficult it is still now. No? And also, if you can comment on the difficulties on organizing a, a IAU conference, because I think you face a lot of them, and it will give us a hint on, on the huge work you've been doing. Yes, thank you, Omaira. So, um, regarding the first question, like how I started and how I ended up in uh, in uh, Ethiopia, um, actually, Africa was uh, all my life really my passion. So, even during my PhD, uh, when I was in Spain at Canary Islands, uh, I did my first volunteer works in uh, Tanzania, Kenya, uh, with uh, with three children and orphan uh, orphans. And then after my PhD, I went to South Africa. And actually, at that time, that that's ten years ago, 
uh, I went to South Africa because I actually wanted to work with the society in Africa. But at that time, South Africa was basically the only place uh, where astronomy was uh, present, you know, in terms of research. And then uh, uh, when I came back uh, to, to Spain for the last uh, six, seven years before moving to, to Ethiopia, um, uh, during all that time, uh, I, I was uh, uh, working in different African countries. So it was always supporting the colleagues uh, from the universities and research centers. And then I managed with time to really strengthen collaborations with, uh, in that way with Rwanda, Uganda, with Zambia, Tanzania, Kenya, with Ghana as well. And I think uh, in Ethiopia, I never worked before I actually moved uh, to live there. But uh, through the colleagues from Rwanda, Uganda, I think they got the, um, uh, uh, the they heard about me and then invi they invited me to, uh, to, to come and help them with the program. So when I actually, uh, the first time when I went, it was in 2015. And at that time, it was the first year when uh, the um, uh, postgraduate program started. So uh, they asked me to give a course uh, in extragalactic astronomy. And at that time, ESSTI still didn't even uh, exist. So I moved there uh, uh, in 2016 when the institute was established. It was only one month after the institute was established. And at that time, there were uh, 20 people uh, in total. Out of these uh, 20, uh, there, was, there were about uh, half, not really half, but uh, let's say third part uh, were people in administration, uh, drivers, uh, so there was a very small number, actually there were uh, five people with a PhD uh, and I was the only, the only female uh, and uh, the only woman and also the youngest uh, uh, PhD holder as well. Um, at this time, after four years, uh, there are more than, there are more than 130 uh, employers at the ESSTI we now have um, uh, different departments. I listed them, uh, so including astronomy, astrophysics, uh, remote sensing, uh, and Earth observations, geodesy, satellite technologies, uh, uh, space physics, and so on. And we are now uh, out of 130, uh, I think around 10 people with the PhD. So the number of people increased a lot. But actually, the majority of people are really young people. They just finished their undergrad uh, studies and they started working with us. And now they still have to go through their MSc, through different trainings, some of them through the PhD and so on and so on. Still, I'm the only female with the PhD. I'm still the only foreigner uh, uh, at the institute. And um, uh, um, for now, we don't have at the astronomy department, we don't have still uh, any uh, PhD student at other departments either. But there are now starting uh, students in MSc that are females. So for astronomy department, uh, we really try to put efforts that every year when there is a uh, um, selection of the students, uh, we put 50-50% for uh, male-female students. So that really um, uh, contributed that we have higher number of female students actually than at other departments, no? Um, so uh, I, I don't know if I replied a bit on your first question, no? Uh, I don't remember yeah. if there was anything else. No, I think it's so, okay, so everything. Yes. And then regarding IU Symposium, uh, it really was a great uh, challenge for, for us. I mean, this was the, uh, biggest event that uh, uh, we organized uh, under the institute uh, ever uh, and uh, because as I said it's it's a very young uh, institute and uh, but the people had uh, some experience with um, uh, smaller meetings uh, previously which definitely helped but organizing the IU symposium was uh, really a double uh, pressure on one side, uh, the usual pressure that you always have uh, as an organizer because you want that everything goes uh, smoothly and well and that all people uh, feel comfortable and that just everything goes uh, fine. But in the same time, there was, at least I felt, the additional pressure because, as I mentioned, it was only the third symposium in Africa in the last 100 years. And the last... the the previous two symposium were organized one in south africa where you have many more um, 
um, tools, you know, for organizing the meeting. And the second one was in Burkina Faso. That was also a challenge, but it was organized by South African uh, colleagues. So here really, I mean, in Ethiopia, I think you, you've seen a little bit, you know, the difficulties that we had uh, even with the power during the conference with, I mean, in Ethiopia, uh, uh, organizing the, you can never uh, make, uh, you can never have 100% security that the things will work in terms of the internet, uh, power access, and so on and so on. So, um, in terms of getting the, but I mean, there, it is possible, definitely. So, uh, inside Addis now, every time more, it is possible to organize uh, big events. So we even from a few years ago we have uh, actually a big, uh, the huge conference room that can uh, host like two to three thousand uh, people. But even so, there have been really challenges in many aspects of the organization and uh, logistics, uh, and then also. Uh, I think for uh, people who were coming, for many people, it was the very first time to come to Africa and to Ethiopia. Uh, and then that also uh, put much more work in terms of really focusing on one by one case of the participant, trying to give all the information so that people can feel comfortable uh, coming and so on. And I mean, the main thing is that there are not many of us. So uh, although I had really a lot of uh, people helping and uh, it was really um, uh, a teamwork and without uh, all colleagues, I mean, I, I wouldn't manage uh, 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 with all the organization. Um, but uh, still uh, we did uh, face many challenges. Also in addition, uh, I mean, uh, one of the additions was uh, that we also wanted uh, to use the opportunity of the IU symposium to really benefit the broader society. So from the beginning, when we submitted the proposal for organizing the symposium, the idea was not only to have the research meeting. The idea was to use nuclear activity in galaxies as a topic and to use the possibility to organize the symposium for the very first time in Ethiopia for several reasons. First, to give the visibility to Ethiopia. I mean, I think really during two years, of like announcing the symposium through the IU pages and so on. Before that, not many uh, colleagues in astronomy knew that there is something going on in astronomy in Ethiopia, or many colleagues even don't know that there are so many things going on in Africa, no, except South Africa maybe, no? So I think, I mean, one of the uh, uh, things was really that, that we uh, can um, uh, give more visibility uh, to, to the uh, astronomy and science in Ethiopia and uh, um, use it also as a, a motivation and uh, uh, inspiration for, for other countries. Then to bring for the very first time uh, uh, the experts from the field to Africa and to Ethiopia and to use that to really motivate our young uh, uh, researchers and our very first master PhD students and so on. And then to really also um, uh, benefit the broader society. So organizing all the activities like students training before the symposium, uh, teachers training after the symposium, outreach activities during the symposium that you also uh, participated, you know, the, um, uh, the um, uh, visit of the Entoto Observatory. Basically every single day there have been things going on, you know, with a lot of logistics and different logistics, you know, for each. So that put additional pressure, you know, that um, because basically each each activity was a separate uh, organization and uh, it was only the group of us that was assigned for everything. So, yeah. So it was a challenge, but I think uh, it was a great uh, experience. Well, yeah. Thank uh, you for coming yeah. once again. Yes, 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 Milena, one last question. How can we help? What do you think is the best way on uh, our, uh, foreign uh, uh, research can help you? There are many possibilities uh, to help. So mm -hmm. starting from basically in a bit uh, all the activities that I mentioned uh, that as you could see is basically different field that we are dealing with. Uh, so starting from the research uh, through the research collaborations and then through the help with the master PhD students uh, supervision as well. Uh, that's one possibility. 
uh, then uh, if people are more also interested for human capacity building then through the trainings uh, uh, through the um, uh, schools that we are organizing constantly like next year we are organizing one school in Ethiopia, another one in Uganda, another one in Tanzania. We will see how they will be organized again with the current situation. But, you know, th these are also the possibilities to get involved and to really help. Um, then uh, regarding the, um, the outreach uh, activities, the, uh, um, the activities that we are running with uh, girls, with uh, women in science, uh, uh, like joining to the networks and the initiatives is another uh, another possibility. Uh, coming to the more uh, continental initiatives, I think now through the African Astronomical Society, there will be more possibilities. Uh, we are currently working uh, uh, in a science committee on making a portal, uh, like a science portal. And in this science portal, we are also planning to uh, upload different uh, initiatives uh, and also let's say opportunities or needs that are there. So that will be available to everybody. So hopefully through that, we will be able to also engage more the international community. Uh, you can always uh, help like when you work on different uh, research proposal, grants, uh, uh, organ uh, when you organize from Mexico, any kind of symposium meeting, think about African colleagues as well. And that you want to make more diverse community and then invite African uh, colleagues to take uh, active participation, uh, either, as I said, through the research or through the meetings organizations. So there are different, really, there are many, many ways to, to do it. Thank you very much for uh, great discussion and great questions as well. Um, I will have follow-up questions, but I will wait till I can do it offline. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, Sundar.